Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker is an impressive improvement from its predecessor that still falls short of greatness. Here's why. Like MGS4, Peace Walker is a very streamlined game. You have crouch movement, over-the-shoulder gunplay, and an even wider variety of guns and gadgets than any game before it. But because Peace Walker was originally designed for the PSP before getting ported to last-gen consoles, it had to snip out a good amount of features. You can no longer crawl, if you're pressed up against a wall you're unable to move, there's no first-person view, and those awesome MGS4 dodge mechanics are gone too. But with the exception of the dodge mechanics, it never really felt like Peace Walker needed any of that. The way levels are designed makes it so that crouch movement is really all you ever need in any given situation. The size of each corridor in the full 360 camera made it so you're always able to see what's around you, and with the exception of boss fights and two missions, you could go every single mission without confronting a single enemy. Which leads into my biggest praise for the game. For the most part, I think Peace Walker is exactly what Metal Gear should have always been in terms of mission design and pacing. There's no annoying set pieces or puzzles, for the most part there's not a lot of backtracking, it doesn't stop being a stealth action game halfway in, and best yet, no terrible escort or rail shooter missions. From near start to finish, Peace Walker stays a stealth action game. And because the campaign is broken up into missions, the end result is a game with tons of replay value. Because you have access to every single part of the game and can pick and choose the parts you enjoy the most. So if you hate the boss fights, you'll never have to play any of them again after Zeke. It's a consistent, accessible experience, and for the most part, it's pretty good. Or rather, the stealth is pretty good, depending on your loadout. I've always believed that the tranquilizer gun has done more harm to this series than good. I'm all for non-lethal methods, but the Trank gun has a nasty habit of just breaking the game, to the point where it's too reliable in any given situation. And nowhere is that more true than Peace Walker. Each environment is a lot more condensed than previous games, and as a result, it's a lot easier to just knock everyone out and jog from A to B. And unlike in MGS3 where you at least had to seek out ammo and suppressors, each mission refuels your gear, meaning you'll always have enough rounds to knock everybody out. And that's compounded by the game rewarding you based on on speed instead of something like, say, avoiding any contact. Perhaps the reason why knocking everyone out is preferable is so you can Fulton soldiers and POWs alike to expand your mother base. Like Portable Ops, Peace Walker has a base building element where your goal is to capture soldiers and build your base in each department into something stronger. Soldiers all have different ranks and specialities, making them suited to specific jobs. The more soldiers you have, the more currency you can spend. And in contrast to games like, say, Assassin's Creed or Division, GMP actually has a practical use, developing gadgets, weapons, the works. And the higher your levels in each department, the better gear you can develop. Now, I'm not really interested in sim features unless customization is more hands-on, so this element of Peace Walker really doesn't do anything for me. Fortunately, it's also pretty benign. It's mostly automated, so it's not super time-consuming, and watching these dumbass AIs is never not hilarious. Ah! Tank versus handgun. Cream of the crop right there, boss. Knocking everyone out and fulton'ing them is how I always remember playing the game back in the day, and it was also why until last year I used to really dislike Peace Walker. But it's when I went minimalist, using the environment to sneak around and neutralize enemies as opposed to just knocking everyone out with a trank gun, that's when I grew to really appreciate this game a lot more. Despite being very condensed, I believe a case could be made for Peace Walker having the best level design of any linear Metal Gear game. Each environment has tons of cover, be it structural or environmental. As a result, bypassing guards becomes a lot more viable, and because of how each room is designed, you tend to have multiple approach paths to any given goal, especially if you bring a cardboard box. And because the minimalist approach is the most enjoyable playstyle, you end up getting a lot more mileage out of the environment. Because unlike MGS 1, 2, and 4, there's a lot more cover spots present from A to B. Meaning I'm far more inclined to use them to bypass enemies because getting past enemies as opposed to knocking them out is way more entertaining. Though that said, the new CQC chain is incredibly satisfying to pull off. A single well chucked smoke grenade is all you need to pull off a really badass takedown on multiple guards at once, and it's never not awesome. This is one of the best things to come out of CQC, which has only gotten better with each passing game. The amount of options in your loadout, playstyle, and level design often results in missions that can play out any number of ways. It's just a shame that to fully appreciate that, I had to limit what I brought with me at any given moment, because otherwise things become way too easy to be fun. I'll get back to that in a moment. First, let's keep it positive with another element of Peace Walker's core gameplay that I really like, extra ops. Much like MGS2's alt missions, Peace Walker is loaded with tons of bonus content. Many of them take place within pre-existing levels and mainly just consist of providing a player with a different objective besides just going from A to B. These are all unlocked bit by bit as you progress through the main ops, and it was here that I was having a lot more fun with missions. I like having objectives with multiple ways to see them through. Whenever I replayed Peace Walker, some of these were the missions I found myself blasting through the most. There's about 120 plus throughout the game, and I enjoy some of them quite a bit. They either get really creative, practical, or directly tied to the main missions. Some were actually pretty hilarious and others were just a bit creepy. <laughs> 
As is, there's enough core gameplay in Peace Walker's main ops alone to match up and even surpass its predecessors. The fact that there's so much extra content on top just because in a game that didn't need any is amazing. And I really want to emphasize that point because a game like Peace Walker for the most part simply wouldn't exist today. This is a game that's as long as it needs to be, tells the story it needs to tell and almost doesn't overstay its welcome. Cap that off with the 12 unique boss fights in the game and dozens of variation bosses and you have a game loaded with heart and enough core content to come back for months without getting bored. With all that said, you might think I really love this game, but unfortunately, you'd be dead wrong. Bullshit! I've come to like and appreciate Peace Walker, but I am incapable of loving this game for one simple reason. This game is clunky as all phantom fuck. Look, until MGS5, you were never exactly Sonic the Hedgehog, but things in Peace Walker are noticeably slower than usual. The simple act of standing up and crouching down takes a lot longer than Metal Gear's usual immediacy. The CQC chain combo is awesome and immediate, but the usual punch-punch-kick combo takes a bit. And holy shit, is the interface for swapping weapons and items inexplicably terrible in this game. Unlike every other MGS game up to this point, switching gear occurs in real time, slowly, which kinda becomes a problem when you're in more frantic situations that require you equipping your gear immediately. And this all comes ahead in the action sequences of Peace Walker because the gunplay sucks. Sure, it's over the shoulder like MGS4, but like the rest of the game, aim is stiff and sluggish, so impact barely registers with enemies. They just stand around shooting until put in a near death state. And the enemies themselves, like MGS4, just stand around shooting. No attack pattern, no sense of variety, just inefficient bullet fodder. Like MGS4, I'm capable of having some fun thanks to the shotgun and lock on aim, and the immediacy of just blasting fools left and right has some gratification to make combat satisfying on a visceral level. But that's only during certain set pieces, not during the moment to moment gameplay. And this certainly didn't translate into any of the game's boss fights because, well, none of them are against people. There are 12 unique boss fights throughout the entirety of Peace Walker. All of them are unique, inventive, and really well designed with a rather wide variety of attacks. Unfortunately, all 12 fights have the exact same problem. They're all giant things with way too much fucking health. Stealth doesn't even factor into any given boss fight. The vehicles, for example, you can silently pick off guards one by one, but with so many in the extra ops, it gets really repetitive. Plus, the vehicles themselves eventually just attack you head on. In the end, your strategies always boil down to shoot until dead, except unlike MGS4, all these bosses take way too long to die. It baffles me how Koji Pro keeps messing up their boss fights when they already perfected the stealth action boss fight with MGS3. This is twice in a row that I've had to mention this, but what made MGS3's bosses so sublime wasn't just that each one was inventive and had a wide slew of attacks. It was that half of the bosses incorporated stealth, and the ones that didn't were so open-ended that you could fight any given boss any number of ways to suit whatever playstyle you were in the mood for. Take the fear for example. You could gun him down, sabotage his food with explosives, poison him or cheese him to death. And designed around that was an enemy with a wide variety of attacks and a boss arena with tons of cover spots and traps to be wary of. It was a marriage of player choice, strong enemy design and strong level design. I'm just re encouraged you to be as creative or conventional as you wanted to be with almost every one of its bosses. That's what made them so awesome and timeless. With Peace Walker, all that shit goes out the window. Instead, here's a giant fucking thing. Shoot it nonstop for 12 minutes. Look, grinding isn't fun. The fact that you literally can't be the single boss without calling for supply drops should have been a dead giveaway that something was wrong. Because no matter how many attacks your boss has, you yourself don't have nearly as many options for fighting them. So after a while, you're just doing the same thing and the boss feels like it's just dragging on. And fittingly enough, the only way to even unlock the other final boss and the ending of the game is to constantly fight the bosses over and over to unlock parts so you can complete your own Metal Gear Zeke. I don't know what the hell it is with Kojima making archaically designed epilogues, but man does the game grind to a fucking halt in its epilogue chapter. All you do is grind out the same dull boss fights repeatedly in order to play hide and seek with Zdornov several times in levels you've already beaten, before fighting your own Metal Gear the J-Pop music. <laughs> Now in fairness, when you have higher grade weapons, you can punch through bosses a lot quicker, and that does make the experience much more bearable. But that still leaves the problem that you're more or less just shooting non-stop. None of the creative player input is present, and it's a shame because I love the idea of having a semi-customizable boss fight, but the feature is moot because regardless of your own Zeke build, the custom fight just isn't fun. And there's a reason why the bosses suck and why there's so much that's considerably less intuitive than Peace Walker's predecessors. This game's most unique selling point is that you can play the entire campaign in co-op, and all its bosses can can be played with four players in total. Just one problem. The campaign is piss easy. All a buddy does is make a game that's already a cakewalk an even bigger cakewalk. Plus the game first released on PSP with local multiplayer only, and most who bought Peace Walker weren't fucking 12. As a result, co-op becomes completely redundant. 
and to compensate, the bosses were all given ridiculous amounts of health so that four players can be given a reasonable challenge. But because the vast majority of players go up Peace Walker alone, the end result is a game with a comically easy campaign that grinds to a halt whenever a boss enters the fray. Look, I'm not against co-op, but I've always maintained that co-op play and solo play should be mutually exclusive. Create a campaign designed for a solo experience, and instead of making 60 retreads of the same three boss fights or dull versus modes that no one plays, Koji Pro could have devoted those resources towards crafting a handful of missions and bosses designed exclusively for co-op. That way, one doesn't completely compromise the other. But as is often the case, Kojima just could not commit. Look no further than these shitty quick-time event riddled cutscenes that dock your rating if you don't get them right. That also happened to lock away the single best mission in the entire game behind a terrible button-mashing torture bit that goes on for way too fucking long. I don't give a shit if torture sequences are a staple of MGS games. Button mashing has not now nor ever been a positive thing for a video game. I have short and stubby fingers, this shit hurts, so fuck you very much for that, Kojim Bob. These sequences either should have been fully playable or just completely non-interactive. Watching a horseback chase isn't made any better by me hitting triangle repeatedly, but nowhere is that other lack of discipline more apparent than the decision to make Peace Walker a co-op game. So let's take a step back and try to follow Kojima's train of logic here, folks. Kojima wants to make a game that you can experience with your friends, so he makes co-op available for almost every single main op and every single extra op. But he doesn't want co-op to get in the way of people who want to play the game by themselves. So he has the team make a campaign that's comically easy for single players, thus rendering the need for co-op redundant. But he doesn't want co-op to be too redundant, so he creates boss fights that are intentionally grindy so they feel like a challenge for four players to tackle. Except in doing so, those boss fights directly impede players who want to play the game by themselves since they take forever to defeat, and the sluggishness makes direct combat incredibly unintuitive and unenjoyable. And this is all in a video game, where co-op, the thing that's directly compromising so much of the solo player experience in a bad way, is local play only. Meaning you can't even do any of this shit unless your buddy is right next to you. Peace Walker is a game I should love, because at its core, there's a really good game here. It's a better campaign experience than most Metal Gear games, and it's stuffed to the brim with bonus content to seek your teeth into. But everything is either too watered down or too tedious to be fun. For all the super creative extra ops the game has to offer, I can count with two hands and one foot the extra ops I actually want to come back to. Puyon's hilarious, but it's not exactly fun when, again, the gunplay's just kinda shit. The campaign has more consistency than any MGS game before it, but it's also let down by brain-dead enemy AI, sluggish combat, tedious boss fights, and a post-campaign that grinds to such a ridiculous halt that I almost didn't want to even finish this game. My feelings on this game are just really mixed, and nowhere is that more perfectly encapsulated than its story. Uh, meow. Uh, meow. Uh, meow. Meow, meow, meow. Wow. I have no idea what you're saying. Of course you wouldn't. The premise is that it's been 10 years since the events of Snake Eater. Naked Snake, aka Young Big Boss, is running his ragtag band of mercenaries, Militaire Sans Frontières, with Master Kazuhira Bandix, McDonald Hellmaster Miller, whom Snake just happened to befriend off screen because references. But then Snake gets called back into the thug life when a shady KGB agent named Zadornov and his fake student Paz send Snake and his team to check out a CIA operation in Costa Rica. Kaz wants in because Zadornov is offering an offshore plant and chopper for a new base of operations, and Snake agreed because his former mentor, the boss, whom Snake killed in MGS3, might still be alive. And along Along the way, intrigue involving the CIA, AI, and nukes happen. Right out the gate, Peace Walker's actual plot is infinitely better than its predecessors in almost every way. For starters, Peace Walker is the most well-paced Metal Gear game in the series. It's as long as it needs to be, always managing to keep momentum going, but unlike the first three Metal Gear games, it takes place over a rather extended period of time, so you no longer have characters getting all worked up despite only knowing one another for a few hours. The journey feels like an actual prolonged journey, not just an event. Peace Walker is really good at building intrigue as well. Instead of laying all its cards on the table through lengthy, insufferable exposition, Peace Walker builds gradual mysteries as the game goes on. Is the boss really alive? Why didn't Paz know Cecile? Is the AI really the boss or just a machine? That's all good stuff. Nothing revolutionary, but it works to keep me interested because I'm asking questions besides how many fucking ways can you talk about nanomachines? There's still lengthy exposition, but mercifully, Peace Walker does away with the fucking codex system. Instead, you have cassette tapes, and through those tapes, you have all the dry, boring exposition you could ask for, only it's not shoved down your throat. You can go all game long without listening to a single tape and still get what's going on. And that is how exposition should be handled, not a prerequisite for basic narrative comprehension. Best yet is dialogue. In contrast to every other MGS game, the dialogue in Peace Walker is actually pretty good. Characters don't just monologue anymore. There's an actual sense of back and forth between most key characters, meaning most character development scenes carry more weight since there's an actual sense of give and take and an even larger presence of banter and humor than we usually get. As a matter of fact, Peace Walker might be the funniest game in the series, and that's exactly what MGS should be. 
ridiculous and fun, but serious when the chips are down. And unlike other games in the series, that sense of humor isn't just in the optional scenes. Snake's sense of humor shines pretty much throughout the entire game. <sighs> what now? MSF brand rations? Actually, that sounds... No, no. Which is just as well because it means the dry plot stuff is actually offset by character moments. Good. You get a free balloon trip for signing up. Enjoy it. You'll feel like a butterfly. I said in MGS3, one of its biggest problems was that the story lacked humanity because most people spoke in monologues and exposition dumps, and that Naked Snake himself was a bland protagonist because he spent most of the game getting talked at, and most of what he had to actually say was inconsequential. Peace Walker Snake, in very stark contrast, might be the best protagonist written by Hideo Kojima. It's very easy to see why someone would join Snake's merry band of mercenaries. He's a genuinely charismatic individual. I just wasted a bullet. Don't waste your life. Listen to me, Chico. You died here today. You understand. You're Ombre Nuevo. A new man. Now. Give that new life to me. Huh? Fight with me, little soldier. Show me how strong you really are. He's also a giant dork, someone who acts like a goofball time and time again and acts like a massive smartass, which makes him both endearing and fun to watch. Listen to me. Every December they set up a hotline and... <laughs> okay, okay, I get it. He's real, I tell ya. He needs to bring me presents and... Snake has real back and forth dialogue with every character around him. Very seldom is he just an information sponge, and that in turn makes him feel human. Only unlike MGS3, his best moments aren't all optional. They're at the forefront of the cutscenes and main radio calls, meaning all the optional tapes are just gravy and that's exactly how it should be. It's brilliant! Huh? The perfect synthesis of stealth and attack power. Compact, elegant design. The finest example of a weapon I've ever seen. Seriously, Kaz, I need to meet the guy who made this. I want to shake his hand. Don't get me wrong, I might like Solid Snake more, but not once has he ever been portrayed in such a consistent manner the way Naked Snake is in Peace Walker. And that goes a very long way towards making the campaign a lot more engaging, when there's a protagonist I actually have reason to give a shit about. So upon hearing that, you might think, wait, didn't you say you have mixed feelings about the story? Everything you said sounds pretty damn positive. And you're right, everything I said was positive because structurally speaking, Peace Walker's story is the most well-constructed, well-paced, and well-presented in the whole series. Unfortunately, it's also in service to the blandest and weakest cast of characters Kojima has ever written. With the exception of Snake, Kaz, and Doctor Strangelove, there isn't a single character in this game worth remembering. For starters, a story is only as good as its main villain. Well, enter Hot Coldman the single least interesting and least entertaining villain not just in Metal Gear but in any game I've ever personally played. This is a cartoonishly evil bad guy who isn't even at least fun to watch. Nothing he says or does is interesting. He shows up, goes on about how smart he is, then gets betrayed and killed. The end. His mindset seems to be that by proving deterrence works, Langley will rehire him. But why does Cold Pants believe that machines and AIs are the future? You can't just say, this is my master plan. There needs to be a reason for why someone is willing to go through the lengths that they go. Regardless of your thoughts on any MGS villain, actually consider the character and how their experiences inform on their motivation. Liquid believed that he was genetic garbage because of his creation and upbringing, so he sought to create a new outer heaven to one-up his old man, doing what Big Boss never could and thus proving that he wasn't inferior garbage. Solidus served as a pawn to the Patriots all his life and knew that his political legacy was a sham, so he wanted to liberate America from the Patriots and prove once and for all that he could actually leave a real mark on history. The boss's father was one of the wise men, and she saw from the inside the order the philosophers brought before the squabbling led to the Cold War, so she sought to gain favor with Volgan to steal his legacy and use that money to rebuild the philosophers and, in her eyes, the world. Ocelot had a hard-on for Big Boss since MGS3 and would do anything for him, like nearly destroying the world in an effort to destroy the Patriots. And finally, as a child, Skullface was burnt to a crisp, lost his family, his country, his native tongue, basically everything that shapes a person's identity. And he, in turn, would associate cultural suppression as a suppression of identity itself. So he planned to use vocal cord parasites to snuff out the world's dominant lingua franca to create a level playing field for all cultures, ensuring in a twisted sort of way that what happened to him wouldn't happen to others. After millions, maybe billions of people die. The villains are either self-serving bastards or the heroes of their own story, who, twisted as they may be, really think that they're doing what's best. Whichever category they fall under, there's still a train of logic to see why they're willing to go through such lengths to see their plans through to the bitter end. 
What train of logic is there for cold pants? There's no reason he has such a hard on for machines, he just does. Even more baffling is the fact that this worthless twat was the one who orchestrated Operation Snake Eater, which had zero bearing on the story. Despite Portable Ops hinting that Zero was the cunning strategist who set everything in motion, Kojimbob decided to backpedal on what other writers set up in favor of an infinitely less compelling substitute. And as terribly bland as Cold Pants is, the rest of the gang ain't much better. Amanda Hug and Kiss is a character we've seen time and time again, except usually these uncertain rebel leaders get more screen time to make their arcs actually feel real, and pretty much the instant Amanda gets out of sick bay, she more or less drops off the face of the earth till the ending. We've seen the kid who doesn't want to be treated like he's a kid but still is about half a billion times already. His scenes with Snake are cute, but not nearly enough is done with him or the fact that he's Snake's first child soldier, and like his big sister, he contributes next to nothing after his segment of the story. Cecile is a nothing of a character, she's a cute French plot device, someone who exists to advance the plot once and then never contribute ever again. Huey, as presented in Peace Walker, is just Otacon with less personality and distinction. He's there so we can make Zeke, but there's no reason he couldn't have just been a new character, and while he at least plays a bigger role than the Sandinistas, as a character there's nothing to him until Phantom Pain. Just like there was no reason for Cause to be Master Miller. Don't get me wrong, I like Cause a lot, but there's no reason he needed to be a pre-established Metal Gear character. Nothing is gained by expanding on a side character whose moment in the sun began as a useless supporting character in Metal Gear 2 and ended as a sorta gotcha moment in MGS1. Cause could have very easily been a character whose fate wasn't already written in stone and nothing would be lost. Finally, you have Paz and Zadornov. If I could describe them in one word each, for Zadornov it'd be meh. Meh because Zadornov is a surprise villain but not really, who only shows up at the very beginning and very end of the game, so who gives a shit? He doesn't even get a boss fight, which would have been perfect for the epilogue, having to fight him at the shooting range in the cat and mouse shootout, which for some reason MGS seems allergic to after MGS3. And for Paz, it'd be shoehorned because that is exactly what the whole cipher reveal in the epilogue of the game is, shoehorned. One of the biggest problems with post-MGS4 Metal Gear is that Kojima created this massive overarching cold war between Big Boss and Major Zero entirely off-screen. MGS3 did fuck all to establish that Zero even cared about the boss, let alone enough to start a crazy cult in her name. And Cypher exists solely to put a face on a faceless Andy that never needed one in the first place. Zero was not now nor ever established as the ultimate big bad of MGS, and we already know how his story plays out. So what the hell is the point of teasing Cypher here when the story could have ended here and now and we'd still see how we got MGS4 Zero? If Kojimbob wanted to actually expand on Cypher, then the time to do so was the main campaign. Cut Coldman and cut the Peace Sentinels, and just make the enemy Cypher. Have the big bad be an underling of Zero, like Skullface, except without an agenda to usurp the throne. That way, the epilogue doesn't feel shoehorned, Snake has a more personal connection with the villains, and then maybe there's an excuse for why the bad guys have such a hard on for AIs, because with Cypher, information and automation is all. It makes zero sense why the entire thing was so disconnected from the main story. It's as if Kojima didn't want to commit to the whole Cypher angle because he realized how terribly underdeveloped and limited the whole thing was, but at the same time still wanted Peace Walker loosely connected to MGS4. Just like the wishy-washy co-op, Kojimbo tried to have his cake and eat it too, having a main story to feature the disconnected main villain and an epilogue to connect things to the larger series. That way he could tell an original story with a new villain whose fate wasn't already set in stone and still tie everything together, only the main villain and his entire motivation sucked boner ass, and the connections to the larger series felt token and unnecessary. But the absolute worst part of Peace Walker's story by far is the emotional arc. Enter the boss again. I don't know what the hell it is about Kojimbob and his inability to let go of his least interesting villains. The boss already met her end in MGS3. There's no need to explore her character beyond that, but Kojimbob brought her back in the form of the Mammal Pod, an AI cylinder with the boss's memories, thought processes, and also voiced by Lori Allen. And this is a whole driving point for Snake, to learn the truth about the boss's final mission. Kojima is so in love with his characters that even when they've already reached their natural conclusion, he has to dredge them back, but why? It does nothing for the plot and even less for the characters. Snake's whole reason for becoming a disillusioned mercenary was learning about the boss's final mission. But after 10 years, he's willing to write all that off to maybe learn if Eva's debriefing tape was part of the cover-up, only to learn at the very end that nope, everything Eva said was legit. So Snake goes through an entire journey just to end up where he started, and that's enough for him to let go of the boss? Because in the end, she chose to stop fighting and that meant abandoning everything she was, including Snake, which, I mean, didn't she already do that when she was presumably a defector? I didn't give a shit about the boss when she was alive, and I give even less of a shit now that she's a cylinder. This isn't character growth, and it's not compelling new territory, it's wheel spinning, and it makes Naked Snake's journey so much less interesting because his development just feels like a holding pattern than actual character growth. It doesn't grow or take Big Boss in new dark places, it remains forever trapped in a holding pattern, where Snake's constantly asking the same thing we already knew the answer to. Boss. 
Why are you doing this? Tell me why! <laughs> Answer me! Why? To make the world one again. So like I said, structurally the plot of Peace Walker is sound, but it's in service of such tepid, cardboard cutout characters, and like MGS3, its emotional weight might as well be on Mars for as little as it ultimately weighs. All of that said, I do like how this game is the true turning point for Naked Snake finally embracing his inner big boss. It's not as overt as him killing innocent people or going nuts. It's a slow, natural burn. From Snake taking child soldiers in to basically turning POWs into loyalists, the fact that he, an unsanctioned, lawless mercenary commander, has the same nuclear capabilities as any nation. As long as there are nukes out there, we need one ourselves if we're going to be a world power. I knew you'd see it that way, boss. So as long as we stand apart from nations, we need something to put us on equal footing. In a way, MSF is a country itself, and we just became the world's seventh nuclear power. Nuclear power. And of course, there's his final speech. Those bitching and moaning that Phantom Pain didn't show Big Boss's descent into villainy either weren't paying attention or just didn't play this game, because that descent was this moment right here. We will sometimes have to sell ourselves and services. If the times demand it, we'll be revolutionaries, criminals, terrorists, and yes, we may all be headed straight to hell. But what better place for us than this? It is our only home, our heaven, and our hell. This is our heaven. In the end, I really have gained a new appreciation for Peace Walker. As a game, it's consistently good and there's so much content that it's bound to appeal to most MGS fans. It flounders in a lot of key areas, but there's ultimately more good than bad. The story is a mixed bag, but it's well-paced and the light-hearted tone is a welcome reprieve from all the melodramatic bullshit of games past. It could have been a lot better, but it also could have been a whole lot worse. And so my final rating for Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker HD is a 7 out of 10. Everything about this game, on the surface, is what I've always felt Metal Gear Solid should be mission-oriented gameplay that lets you jump right into the parts of the game you actually enjoy the most without suffering through the parts you hate, an abundance of boss fights, consistent stealth action-oriented gameplay, fewer set pieces, open-ended level design, missions that are about more than just going from A to B, and a protagonist that isn't just getting talked at. It just needs to do all the things it did better. So whatever your thoughts, let me know in the comments. If you like this review and want to see more, click the subscribe thing. Next on the agenda is Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes, and then finally, Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Menace. Anyway, thanks for watching, and what the hell is wrong with this guy's face?